This topic certainly reminded me of my undergrad days. Somehow, I used to understand hashing a little bit, but when it came to consistent hashing, I got so much confused. I wished there should be an easier explanation to all of it. It should not be so much complex. So that is why I wanted to make this video and simplify consistent hashing. And trust me, you will never forget after watching this video. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. As you know, this topic is a continuation in my system design series. And if you want a quick recap, we have covered a lot of topics. We went over all of the essentials. Then we looked at some of the fundamental things that you should know about. After that, we started creating diagrams and then we went into optimizing all of our processes. We always want to make sure that the end user gets the best experience. They want the least downtime and they want a faster service. Based upon all of this, we have actually covered some of the design essentials as well, like a cap theorem, a rate limiter, a unique ID generator, a URL shorter, all of these topics. And they are real fun to solve. If you are looking at all of this for the first time, it is not necessary that you go through all of them. Consistent hashing can be independent, but I would highly recommend you to check out some of these designs because they give you an actual idea how all of these systems work in an actual life. So now let us try to talk about consistent hashing. First of all, you need to understand why do you even need hashing in the first place? And to make things simple, we will take up a very, very basic example. Suppose you are writing a software or a server which behaves as Ticketmaster or Book My Show. Basically a platform where a user can log in and they can book tickets. So what does a high level design look like? Suppose you are only creating a system just for your college students. What will happen? You have a client and then you have a web server. You are communicating with the client through logging in, creating an event and doing all sorts of those things. Then you need to have a database where you store every information. For example, you can have lot of events. Each event will have an ID and based upon that ID, you can keep all the information in a database. For example, since this system is very small, let us say you have 10 events. So each of the event will have an ID, right? One, two, three, four, and all the way up to 10. What you will do is for each event, you will store some information in your database. If you're talking about event three, you know that, okay, I need to look in my database for an event three. Wonderful. Everything works and your system works perfectly. Now what happens? Let us say the system you wrote became very, very famous and you want to bring it up to a very large scale. So now you're looking at thousands of events, not just a college event, correct? They can happen all throughout the country. So what happens now? In that case, you will need to have a lot of databases to store the information about your events, correct? In this case, you can have a lot of events. You can have a hundred thousand events. So what do you do now? If a client logs in and they connect to your web server. Now, how do you decide which database do you want to keep your information in? That is the scenario where you need hashing. You need to shard out your process. You need to make sure that your data is evenly distributed. This is where a simple concept of hashing comes in. Hashing lets you decide that, okay, where do you want to send your data to? Let us say I have some event. The most basic way of hashing is that you just find out the number of servers and you do a modulus on your event ID. For example, let us say the event ID is 1234. Now number of servers is 3. So you do a modulo 3 and that gives you 1. With a modulo, you know that the resulting answer will be in the range of 0 to 2. And this is how you can distribute your databases. So what will happen? This particular event will go to DB index one. You are storing it over here. Similarly, let us say I have another event, 6666, and you do a modulo three, and this time you will get a zero. It means this particular event should be stored in DB zero index. Let's say I got one more event. This time I got 5612. You modulo this by three, and this time you will get a two. So this particular event will be stored in database number two. What just happened? You had three different events possible and you were able to distribute your data. Now, if someone has to query this data, you will say that, okay, what is your event ID? I'm going to say, okay, my event ID was 6666. 
This is how the client is communicating with your server. Now, how do you want to look up that event? How do you determine, hey, what database my event was in? Once again, you will use this formula. So you will try to modulo it by three. You will get an index. And this is how you know you need to look up in this particular database. Everything works wonderfully. You were able to partition out everything. And with hashing, you were able to even separate all of your events. You were able to write to a database. And at the read time, you again use the same formula to determine, hey, this is the database I want to read from. Everything seems perfect, right? So what's the problem with this approach? Let us say your site becomes even more famous and you want to add in a new database. Or let us say you want to upgrade an older database. For that, you will need to first add in a new database, correct? So currently, what just happened? I added a new database over here. Now, for all the new events that are coming in, they will get partitioned automatically, right? Because instead of doing a modulo by three, you can now do a modulo by four. So the events will go in the right databases accordingly. But there is a certain problem. You also need to re-index all of your previous events. Think about it. For example, I had an event 6666. In my previous condition, I was doing a modulo 3 and that sent my event to db index 0. Correct? Now what happens? Let us say the client logs in and they want to check some information about their event. 6666. Where do you read from? Will you try to use the same formula? If you try to do it, what will happen is you will get 6666 modulo 4 and this time the result will be 2. What will happen is you will try to look up in the wrong database and it simply means that you will not find your information over there. So what do we need to do? You will actually have to go over each of the event that you had and then rehash all of your information. And that is going to cost a lot of time. You will basically look at each of these databases, each of the event ID, rehash them with modulo four, because now you have four servers and then distribute the load again evenly. So you see what is happening. You are going to end up taking so much memory, so much CPU, and this is going to peak the traffic on all of the databases. They are going to slow you down. Similarly, you will face a similar problem when you try to remove a database as well. For example, let us say you had three databases as of now, correct? Suddenly, one of your databases went bad. It got corrupt. Now, what do you do? For all of the new events that come in, okay, you can update your number of servers and they will be two. So, all of the new data will get distributed in these two databases, correct? But what about the old information? It's the same problem as adding a new database, correct? You cannot apply the same formula to look up in your old information. You will once again have to iterate over all of the events that were available and then rehash it using just two number of servers. And then you will balance your load evenly. I hope now you can understand what is the problem with a simple hashing approach. It can be very well possible that when you're adding a new database or when you're removing a database, you will be redistributing a lot of data. This causes a lot of spike in the memory usage and it can slow down your system overall. And as you know, when it comes to system design, you want an efficient system. You want performance. You do not want to compromise the user experience. Because think about it. If a website is often slow, do you come back to it again? No, you will try to find other alternatives which are fast. And that is why everyone focuses on, okay, this should be our uptime. And hey, our status is always good. So we identified the problem. But how do you solve for it? This is where the concept of consistent hashing comes in. And there are some fundamental things that you should be aware about. First of all, how do you set it up? What we do is, let us say I have these four databases available with me. Now, how do you place them? What I'm going to do over here is, I am going to distribute a circle and have certain partitions on it. For example, over here, I have a hundred partitions and I have distributed them on a circle. Now, you will take up your databases and try to put them uniformly all over this circle. For example, what I can do is I can take up this particular database and place it at partition 0. I take DB1 and place it at partition 25. I take DB2 and I place it at partition 75. 
and the last database, I can place it at partition 50. Now what happens? Certainly, your events will start to come in. If you check, what were the three events that I was getting? The first event ID that I got was 1234. The second event ID was 6666. And the third event ID was 5612. Now, instead of doing a modulo with the number of servers, you need to modulo by the number of partitions that you have. Over here, I have 100 partitions. So what I'm going to do is I will modulo them by 100. What is the first result that I get? For my first case, I get a result of 34. Now, how do you decide where to put this information? You check your ring. Where will you find 34? You find 34 somewhere over here. Now, to determine which database this event has to go, start from this position and go in the clockwise direction. If you start moving over here, I get DB number 3. That is how I decide I will place this particular event in DB3. So you got one of your partitions correctly, right? Look at the next event now. For this, I will get 66. And where will 66 lie in my ring? 66 is somewhere over here. So once again, start from over here and move clockwise. You get DB2. So this particular event belongs to DB2. How about the last event now? As soon as I do this, I will get a 12. Locate 12 over here and now start to move in the clockwise direction. You get DB1. So that is where I am going to place this particular event. This is how you can decide which database do you pick and where do you put up your event. And this is a very simple scenario. That is why I only took 100 partitions. For production scenarios and very large systems, you can have n number of partitions. And that is just based upon your use case. And now comes the actual question. How is this better than my simple hashing? What happens when I face the same problem? Adding a new database and removing a database. What about it? This was my initial setup, right? Let us say I want to add a new database. Now, where do I put it? The general idea is that you find the biggest gap that is possible and try to insert a database somewhere between that partition. Currently, all of my partitions are kind of uniform. So what I can do is I will just take up this database and let us say I insert it over here. What happens now? In the case of simple hashing, I had to now rehash all of the events that I had. Correct? But if you think about it now, what was happening? For all of these events, initially, what database were they going to? If any of those events came in, they would go to database 3. But since I have now added a new database, what will happen? All of these databases that are up to the point where I added my new database, only these events need to be rehashed. So all these events will go to my new database. Notice that you don't have to touch any of these other events. That is the beauty of consistent hashing. So instead of going over all of the events, you narrow down only to this particular subsection. So if any new event comes in and you land at this partition, instead of sending to DB3, they will now go to DB4. And you are also gonna rehash all of the previous events that were available in this partition. Similarly, if one more DB comes in, now where do you place it? Right now, my distribution is not uniform. So you do not want to place it somewhere over here. You want to ensure that your system stays consistent. So let us say this time I will try to put it somewhere over here near partition 87. So what will happen? Initially, all of these events were hashed to DB0 because you landed at this point and then moved in the clockwise direction. But now what do you need to do? All of these events from 75 to 87, they need to go to DB5. So this is the only number of events that you will want to rehash. This is how consistent hashing saves you so much time and so much memory overhead as well. Similarly, removing a database is also the same. For example, this was my original setup, right? Let us say one of your databases went down and you wanted to remove it. In case of a simple hashing, you will have to rehash all of your events. But now what happens? You only need to rehash this particular section. Because any event that landed here, it used to go to DB3. But now what will happen? All of these events also will go to DB2. 
So you're only hashing a section of events. And this is what keeps things under control. And I feel that this simplifies consistent hashing so much. You don't have to worry about any of the complex things involved. If you think about it, we have actually made very good progress. Our system is much more efficient. There is just one last part remaining. If you look at my initial setup, all of these databases, they may seem that, okay, they are very much distributed. What happens in a case if your events are very much skewed? Let us say all of the events that you're getting, they land up in this particular partition. What will happen? All these events, they will keep going into DB1, correct? So you would want to balance your load somehow. But how do you do that with consistent hashing? You only have four databases available, correct? This is the case where you can take the help of virtual nodes. So virtual nodes are actually nothing. You will have your original databases over here. But what I can do is I can create a virtual node for database zero and I can place it anywhere on my ring. Similarly, I can have a virtual node for database one and I will place it anywhere on my ring. These virtual nodes are just a pointer in your ring to ensure that your data is distributed consistently. Similarly, I can create more virtual nodes. For example, this is a virtual node for database two and this is a virtual node for database three. And they are not limited. You can have virtual nodes like VN1, VN2, VN3, and even for the same database. So I can place more as well. What benefit it is giving you? For example, I had skewed events. So all of these were landing at database one, correct? But since I added these virtual nodes, so if I get any events between this partition, you go in the clockwise direction and you find node number two. So instead of putting in DB1, you can put it in DB2. You can think of it like a linked list. It is just a address to a certain database that you already have. So everything actually remains the same. These are just memory addresses and it is kind of an advanced concept. You only need to discuss about it if your interviewer is very much interested, if they want to make the system even more efficient. Certainly adding and removing nodes can get a little bit complex, but if you have reached this far, I guess removing and adding nodes is also not a problem. Think about it. What will happen if DB2 dies out? This node is gone and you have to redistribute some of the data. Similarly, this will also go away and this will also go away. So initially, if you were just rehashing this particular portion, you need to account for this information and this information as well. And this is just implementation details. And certainly you can design a system when you get to actual coding. That is certainly not the scope of this video, but I want you to make sure that you understand consistent hashing in a very simplified manner. So where would you say consistent hashing is actually used? Whenever you hear the term distributed, for example, if you have to design a distributed database, this is the technique you have to use. If you want a distributed cache, again, the same approach. If you want to have a distributed message broker, this is the same approach. Because if you have 10 different consumers possible, then you want to arrange them in consistent hashing. That allows you to add more consumers also whenever your system grows. So that's why consistent hashing is very, very important and asked in a lot of coding interviews as well. So what do you feel about this approach? Were I able to simplify things for you? Tell me everything in the comment section below and also let me know what problems did you face. I would really like to discuss all of it as it helped me to learn even more. And once again, as a reminder, if you found this video helpful, please do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with friends. This really keeps me motivated and I can make more such videos. Also, a huge shout out to all of the members who support my channel. You guys really keep me going. As a member, you do get priority reply to your comments and early access to new videos as well. Stay tuned for my upcoming videos. Until then, see ya.